Welcome back to the Bitcoin layer. I'm Nick Batia, and today we bring in Sam Wouters. He is a research analyst at River, our sponsor, and he just put out a fantastic report on Lightning Network. Sam, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Excited to be here. So, Sam, tell us quickly about your Bitcoin story. How did you find Bitcoin? How did you end up at River? Uh, so I used to play this online game, which had its own trading economy in it. And you could exchange the virtual currency that you had in there for real life currency, as there were people that couldn't really be bothered to spend hours gathering that currency inside the game. And you basically needed a way to facilitate that, which like basically without getting charged back as can happen with other payment methods. And that's kind of where Bitcoin got some appeal. Like some people started using that. And as a result, I started looking into it with a friend and uh, the rest is sort of history as I got pretty interested in how this could possibly be a thing where you had a currency that wasn't controlled by some uh, central party. And it immediately resonated with me, the digital scarcity as you had inside the game itself as well, where you had scarce virtual goods. So uh, it kind of immediately clicked for me. And then how I ended up at River many years later, after doing a lot of education and writing and public speaking, um, just through a tweet from the CEO. So he tweeted, we're looking for a researcher or analyst. Uh, I actually had the qualifications, but I figured, well, I'm based in Europe, River is based in the US. So what are the odds they'll want me? Uh, but the odds were good. So uh, here I am. Excellent. And Sam is joining us today from the Netherlands. Sam, talk to us about uh, the specific game and the specific currency, because I think our audience will want to know, uh, oh, yeah. you know, sure. the more specifics about that origin, because it is that the dynamic of chargebacks being something we can avoid with Bitcoin is game changing for those that experience chargebacks. Yeah. Uh, so the, back then, the biggest sort of MMO game was World of Warcraft. The second biggest was called RuneScape. And that's the one that I play, played. Like most people will know the biggest one. Second one was a bit less known, but there are a good number of people who used to play that back then, or some might still because it's still around, uh, who actually got into Bitcoin as a result, because a lot of the concepts really resonated. And like the, the game itself, it just has like gold coins essentially, but you can have very large amounts of those and all kinds of goods in, uh, in that game that are worth a bunch of money as well. The Bitcoin layer is proud to be sponsored by River. Go check them out today at river.com slash TBL. Why do we love River? River is a Bitcoin only exchange. They offer lightning network deposits and withdrawals. And most importantly, guys, they do not outsource custody of their Bitcoin and customers' Bitcoin to a third-party custodian. River has its own multi-sig custody solution. That means that it is not using some other company to store Bitcoin that is purchased within their platform. So make sure you go check them out, river.com slash TBL, and learn about River today. Excellent. And talk to us about why River does research. River, as we know, is a, an, exchange, an exchange platform allowing people to purchase Bitcoin. So why produce, why produce research content? So like, I think the simplest answer is that if you write the, let's say the 327th article on what is Bitcoin mining, it's kind of hard to stick out from the crowd and show people kind of like the, the kind of information that you can provide. There's, it's good content to make. But with the research, it gives us a moment to really stand out and, and dive a bit deeper into what is going on. Um, and I like to look at this as like a lot of people talk about Bitcoin's price and kind of look at the short term of things like trying to find ways to make money. And when you speak to people about Bitcoin, that can be one of the prevalent things that you're talking about, you know, price appreciation and how to make money. And we have a lot of clients and, and just typically people who invest a whole bunch of money into Bitcoin with us. And they are also interested in fundamentally, is there something behind this whole thesis? Is it all just people hyping each other up that the price is going to go up? Um, some people might read things about Bitcoin mining and feel like insecure about its future. So then by diving into the research and like going much deeper, we can provide some insights to those people as well into, does this actually have a long-term future? If we look at the data, like lots of people talk about the lightning network and about how Bitcoin should scale. If we look at the data there, is it actually growing or is it all talk and 
people are like trying sort of they get the feeling that they're falling for something that isn't actually uh, like that doesn't actually have a solid foundation. So with the research, we clear part of that up. We provide deeper answers. There is also strategic benefit to us because there's always a link with what we are doing uh, as a business. So in, in this case, it's related to River Lightning, which is our service that we provide to businesses to easily integrate with Lightning. So we also want to know, like, is that actually smart as a business to, to build out this service? Like, does that have a long-term future? Or is it the case that Lightning isn't really being used or adopted? And of course, we found the opposite. Like, it is, in fact, growing really rapidly. Um, and that's important for us to highlight. As you can imagine, in some of those sales conversations, companies will ask us, that sounds really interesting and sounds like phenomenal technology, but is anyone actually using it? We don't really have a way to tell from the outside perspective. So with the research, we have a bit of an answer to them. And the answer may not satisfy everyone, but for a good number of people, it might. So It sounds like in the end, you're, you are trying to serve your clients with information. Now, you did yep. steal a little bit of my next question, Sam, which is why Lightning? Now, if we just look at raw numbers, the market cap of Bitcoin is over $500 billion and the size of Lightning Network today by public capacity is far under 1 billion. So we're talking a fraction of 1% of the network in this technology, but you've obviously, and your firm have dedicated resources to serving this Lightning economy and the idea that Lightning Network is the scaling solution for Bitcoin. So despite its size, why lightning and why produce this report? Is it something that you just think that Bitcoin cannot go without going forward? Is that what is that the approach here with lightning? Yeah, I think one thing that has become clear over the years is that lightning is here to stay and everyone else who is building different kinds of scalability solutions, they're all looking at can we sort of be interoperable with lightning in some way. So nobody is assuming we're going to replace this thing or, or build some kind of competitor to it. We need to figure out ways to build on the network effect that already emerged from Lightning. And sort of that effect and a promise of the network is something that River uh, recognized pretty early on. We were one of the first exchanges to integrate with it. And with River Lightning, we also service uh, El Salvador's Chivo wallet. Um, so like the goal there was basically to like dive in early, look at this technology, see how we can contribute. And that's very much been the focus of the report as well as figuring out, can we provide all these different companies and people in the space that are trying to build things on top of Lightning? Can we provide them some kind of tool that allows them to fight back against misinformation around like how much activity there is that allows them to have conversations with potential partners or clients or investors to really show the momentum that is going on there? And uh, that's been very much the focus of the report, like creating a tool for pretty much everyone in the lightning industry who uh, has been focused on it so much. So I definitely see a long-term future for lightning and uh, it's been super exciting to work on this. We can, we can attest to that, that we, you know, we are using this data now actively. The, the report is only a few days old, but it's already something that we are using uh, to give us more signals. So I promise the audience, we will get into the research report in a second. But the last question I have before we get into some of these numbers, Sam, is take us back to the basics. Some of our audience is coming in as new time Bitcoiners. Why does the network effect of Lightning Network, which you just talked about, you talk about that we have to build on Lightning and improve Lightning because Lightning has already established a network effect as Bitcoin scaling solution. Tell us, tell the audience why the Lightning Network effect compounds with the Bitcoin network effect to give us a new global money and to tell us that, yes, Bitcoin is actually the way forward for the world in digital decentralized money because of now two network effects compounding with each other. Is that something you would agree with? And it, take it back to the basics for global Bitcoin adoption, what this means. Yeah, so one of the advantages of Lightning is that you are still using Bitcoin. You're not swapping it for some other kind of token, uh, it is the same currency. So you are in that sense, you are benefiting from what has already been built up on the Bitcoin base layer itself and just using the exact same currency on Lightning 
which is really just Bitcoin that is put into smart contracts to establish financial relations between people. And it essentially allows you to exchange value at a global scale where, Nick, you might have a relation in Japan, for example, that I want to send money to, and my, my node can simply send it through your node to that person, and you might charge a small fee for that. So you get this benefit of the world being so connected where like, I don't need to think about how could I reach that person. My node will simply check with my relations of my network how exactly I can get money to the other side of the world if I need to, and it will find the fastest and cheapest route to do that. And that's a tremendous benefit that Bitcoin itself on the base chain cannot satisfy. Like it cannot do those instant payments because of the block confirmation time of like on average 10 minutes. So you'd always be waiting there. And that is not always viable for all kinds of business cases uh, on, on the internet itself. Like if you're buying something from a store, then ideally you just do the instant payment and get the goods or services in return. So basically Lightning, it complements Bitcoin in very nice ways where it enables low value payments that have been priced out of the blockchain, still using the same currency uh, as on the Bitcoin base chain, as I mentioned. And then it adds that that flexibility of instant payments uh, and all kinds of other things that we are beginning to discover um, that sort of like make it a really nice synergy of those two systems. So it's not just that you are doing sort of more of the same and thus achieving more scale, which has very much been one of the focuses of building out the Lightning Network, but it's that it also enables new types of use cases that just aren't possible without it. So Lightning effectively extends the capabilities of the Bitcoin network without like cannibalizing on it in any kind of way or without competing with it in any kind of way. It's an added value on top of something that we already find useful and have a lot of trust in. And uh, yeah, that's just awesome to see those two sort of collaborate in a way or add value to each other. Sure. So let's uh, get into some of the numbers here. So you say that the average size of a Bitcoin Lightning Network transaction is about $12, 12 US dollars. And um, so compare that to what we would see on Bitcoin, talk about continue this thesis out of that it extends the use case. And then I'll bring in, um, I'll bring in a graph that we wanted to discuss here, which is lightning is increasing Bitcoin's transactions per day, which is what you're saying is that we're actually expanding the usability of Bitcoin through lightning. And we can see that with this graph where we have about four transactions per second with Bitcoin and about two, two and a half transactions now, additionally with Lightning Network. So talk about this $12 average, how that compares and uh, adding these transactions to the total throughput of Bitcoin. Well, the average on-chain transaction is of course significantly higher, like in the, uh, I, I remember looking at the numbers, uh, but I don't believe I included them in the report, but it's in the thousands and thousands of dollars because there are some, you know, multi, million to a billion dollar uh, plus transactions on the lightning uh, sorry on on chain and those of course pull up the average significantly uh, the median transaction size there might be a bit more relevant but nonetheless it's many times larger and what you see as a result is that those large transactions they don't really mind paying a sizable fee because you are settling enormous amounts of money for relatively cheap like i believe even the biggest like the biggest on chain transaction ever was about two-ish billion dollars at the time and paid about 78 cents in fees, which is really low. Uh, of course, that one wouldn't be able to go on the Lightning Network because that's a little bit too much value uh, today anyways. But um, I think what's what's interesting there is that uh, like that average transaction size, and also if you look at the distribution of which we also have a graph, basically 88-ish percent of the transactions on Lightning would not even be feasible on chain because if the average on-chain fee is somewhere around like, I believe in 2022, it was around like one and a half ish dollars or so. But if it's around two dollars or so, let's let's call it that. Then a lot of those payments that are happening on Lightning today just cannot go on-chain because the entire transaction size is the fee. So all of those transactions essentially get priced out, whereas on Lightning, they are possible uh, and you can send them as many times as you want. And as a result, that's that's kind of what I'm referring to is it extends the possibilities of what is uh, happening on the network as a whole, like what Bitcoin can do. And I love the visualization of just putting the on-chain and then extending the lightning 
just so we can see that Bitcoin is growing through lightning in addition to whatever is happening with Bitcoin itself. Uh, so talk to us about the cap. So I'm a frequent lightning network user. I can, I can uh, attest also to my average transaction size is about 20 US dollars worth of Bitcoin when I use the lightning network. Uh, I am generally speaking, one of the, uh, one of the eight out of nine that you say uses a custodial lightning network wallet. I, I personally mm -hmm. use wallet of Satoshi. You can probably maybe talk about for a minute, the role that wallet of Satoshi has played in some of the adoption in lightning network over the last year plus. Um, but then talk about the cap. So I've experienced once you get up into a few hundred dollars that sometimes there is difficulty using the Lightning Network. So just tell us about the cap as well as Wallet of Satoshi and how people are using this network today. Sure. Yeah, I think for the cap, it obviously like it, it depends on sort of how how far removed from you you're trying to send a transaction. So if there are lots of nodes in between to reach that other party then the odds increase that there's going to be an issue somewhere along the route. Um, so that fluctuates a good bit. And the hard part about it today is that, you know, your wallet doesn't tell you like, this is sort of the maximum that you could like reliably send over the network. There is no, no UX like that because it's not constantly checking for the maximum that it can send across the network as that's a lot of requests between all of the nodes. So on sort of a technical level, you can imagine there that if every node in the network was constantly asking every other node how much value they can pass through that generates a lot of chatter and that uses up a lot of data. So as a result, it's kind of the case today that you just have to sort of take a leap of faith and be like, hey, I want to send this size of transaction. I'll just try it out. And if it doesn't go through, then it doesn't go through. Uh, you don't risk losing the money or anything like that. But it is, of course, a bad user experience if it wouldn't go through. Now, there's also the reality that once a payment is over a significant size, let's say you want to send $1,000 over the Lightning Network, then the question is kind of like, why not do it on-chain? Because if all you're paying on-chain is like a $2 fee or so, that's a very minuscule fee as a share of the entire transaction. So Lightning today is very much useful for lower value payments uh, that have essentially been priced out of the blockchain. So that is like kind of what you were referring to, like a few hundred dollars at most. And once the average on-chain fee starts to rise significantly, that's when it might start becoming more interesting to send larger payments over the Lightning Network. But then you will also start seeing naturally without anyone intervening that people just start putting more capital on the Lightning Network. You'll start seeing more nodes in there, just more people get involved in general because there start to be fees to be earned. Like the average fee will potentially gradually increase or the activity will increase a lot and thus the overall fee revenues will be higher. So this is kind of a, a, a problem, so to speak, that solves itself where market participants will join in and thus increase the uh, average transaction size, the maximum transaction size that reliably goes over the Lightning Network. Yeah, we've, we've for a long time talked about how routing activity on Lightning Network itself is a capital market and it brings capital to chase yield, chase returns, and it's a natural flow of money. It's just arbitrage, really, when you break it down to um, yeah. the basics. Sam, now talk to us about the headline of the report, this 1,212% growth in the number of Lightning transactions. So you and I were discussing just before we recorded, should we be talking about volume or transactions? You told us transactions is what we wanted to headline. Why transactions? And talk to talk to us about this growth over the last two years. Yeah, I think like if you would try to think of it from an sort of an, an investor's perspective on like, hey, there might be a lightning company that you want to invest in in some way, or you might want to invest in the lightning network in any kind of way because you believe in it. Then the main thing that you would probably be looking at is how many times does someone want to interact with lightning? Like how how popular is this of a solution? with then sort of secondary, the, the volume part, which is still relevant uh, because you don't want to only focus on like one Satoshi payments or anything like that. Um, but transaction growth just shows that that change in, in interaction with the Lightning Network and how many new solutions have emerged as well that make use of those very low value payments to stream Satoshis 
uh, as there's a good bit of activity in that as well. Um, and that's sort of the, the main driving force behind interest in the network, uh, we believe, is the number of transactions on there. Um, with them volume, like it's still very significant and very relevant. But I, yeah, I think in general, if you'd ask most people, like, what do you care about most? then it would most likely be the number of transactions on there. Excellent. So 1,200% growth over the last couple of years. Uh, it, it tells us what? It tells us what about this network? Obviously, it's growing, but characterize the transactions for us and um, really describe this growth uh, of the Lightning Network. Is it, yeah. is it as dynamic and exciting for this new relatively young network on top of Bitcoin as the headline number shows. Yeah, I think it's super exciting, uh, especially because we touched on the capacity earlier. So how much Bitcoin is actually in channels in, or in public channels on the Lightning Network? Around 5,000 Bitcoin in, in August 2023, which is what the main data was based on as it takes a bit of time to gather everything. And if you just look at the capacity number, then it's really easy to and, and the graph of that, which is in the report as well, then it's really easy to get the perspective that capacity hasn't changed much over the past years. So like, how can we tell if there's actually more interest in using Bitcoin, uh, uh, sorry, in using Lightning, because that part hasn't really changed. And the reason is that capacity is just, it's essentially a vanity metric to get an idea of how much sort of public interest is there in the network. But let's say Coinbase joins the Lightning Network tomorrow and they put 10,000 Bitcoin in their Lightning node. But that 10,000 Bitcoin, maybe like 9,500 of that is never moving. It's not doing anything because it's just redundant. It's not really needed. So did the Lightning Network then become like two or three times more successful than it is now? Of course not. Uh, but that is how a lot of people like the way they talk about the Lightning Network is just by looking at that capacity and saying, hey, uh, I think this is the thing that defines how much interest there is. And it's not that surprising that there isn't more capacity, that there aren't more nodes that are, haven't been more channels over the past while, because in the past two years, which is what the report is based on, the interest in Bitcoin and the price dropped by like 45% each, which is a really significant decline. So that basically means that for the most part, new activity would need to come in from existing users, from people who already care about Bitcoin, who already understand it, and then that group of people growing the activity on Lightning over 1,200% is really significant, I think. It really shows that there is just a clear need for people to start figuring out, hey, what else can we start doing with Bitcoin rather than just sit on it, uh, hold it as a store of value? Can we really start building this future that we want to see where Bitcoin is not just a store of value, but also a medium of exchange and a native currency to the internet? And that's really what you're seeing here in this growth of transactions as the adoption, like it's, it's growing across a whole bunch of different, uh, use cases. And I think that's like a testament to what everyone's been working on over these past years. And then, but it, the volume is also increasing by hundreds of percent over this two year time horizon as well. So it's not just the transaction, the money is actually moving, uh, at an increasing pace as well. So whether you measure it in USD or in nominal Bitcoin, because obviously the exchange rate will make those numbers fluctuate. The, it's between 500 and 900 percent the growth over the last two years in volume itself. So it's not just the transactions. The volume is increasing, but we do, uh, as Sam is guiding us, we do want to look at transactions because it's the usage. It's how many times a day people are using Lightning Network and uh, capacity just isn't a good metric to measure how successful this thing is. It's important to see what is out there and maybe a good additional metric to use, but it shouldn't be the first or second metric that we go to. Uh, Sam, let's talk a little bit about Lightning around the world. So you have a graphic in here. Lightning wallets installed by country based off of Thunder Games uh, organic search data. So Thunder is a Lightning Network gaming company. Maybe you can just introduce Thunder, your relationship with them, and then talk about this data showing us that United States is the number one country in terms of Lightning Network adoption, but that we have good adoption from all the continents around the world. 
Yeah. Um, so Thunder Games was one of the companies that was helpful enough to share a lot of their data. And without the help of a bunch of these companies, I wouldn't have been able to be as extensive in the report as I was. As in last year's report, we could only share sort of River's perspective on the Lightning Network, which is insightful for people, but it's far more interesting to get a broader view of the network. And that's something that Thunder Games really helped with. Uh, what's also interesting from their perspective is that they, uh, they basically allow people to earn Bitcoin for playing games. And that is a very different use case from what River itself does with River Lightning. So it gives you like an additional insight into what's going on in the network as they have uh, what I was already referring to there with those uh, very small payments. Like there's a lot of activity like that for them where users just get paid out small amounts of Satoshi's for completing levels or reaching objectives and whatnot. And that also gives us an insight in like what's happening on that end of the network, whereas we tend to process some larger transactions some like maybe some remittances or all kinds of business payments. And that just gives us a very interesting uh, opposite side of the network, so to speak. Um, so yeah, super helpful to get all kinds of data from them. And they had this sort of proprietary data as when uh, a user installs any kind of game related to them, then the wallet is, or sorry, the app essentially needs to check, does this user have a lightning wallet? Because if they don't, then during the onboarding process, we need to show that user, Hey, you don't have a lightning wallet yet, but if you want to actually withdraw money from this game, then you're going to need one. So please install one. So they need to put that check in there in the process, not to spy on the person, but just to figure out like, can we actually give them the value proposition that they downloaded this app for? So as a result, by them sharing that data, we got insights into uh, if a person downloads that app, what is the percentage of those people that already has a Lightning Wallet installed? And as you mentioned in the United States, that is the largest number, which is like in a way not super surprising given that uh, overall Bitcoin interest and adoption is highest in the US globally. Uh, if you look at like Google's, Google search trends, et cetera, or Google trends uh, data anyways. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other countries, as you mentioned, around the world where it's higher. I did also find it interesting to point out a country where it's surprisingly lower than expected, which was Turkey, because in Turkey, like they're among the top countries for Bitcoin interest in the world, which you can check in Google Trends. But then, uh, and, and I believe some other tools as well, but then their lightning adoption is still significantly lower because the need for Bitcoin as a store of value there is so tremendous because of the trouble with the Turkish Lira. But lightning adoption there has tremendous room for growth as they like aren't as on top of that yet in all places. And I'm not saying it's not being used there, but it was a clear outlier sort of from what you would expect in the, uh, in the averages there. And Sam, can you talk to us about this next, next graphic where we show a map of the world and we see Bitcoin flying around via the Lightning Network from Zebedee, Strike, uh, to Brazil, Nigeria, Kenya, India, Vietnam. Talk about yeah. Lightning transactions from one continent to, continent to the next. Are there big node players? You have some companies here. Are these companies uh, those that participated in some of your data collection. Just walk us through this uh, global graphic here, please. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, many of those weren't willing to share data. And uh, like, I also understand when companies don't because we are one of the larger participants in the network and thus companies can be hesitant to share a lot of information with us. Uh, but what that specific graph is meant to show is not just like exchanges on which you can uh, like withdraw and deposit using lightning, but it's a very specific use case where a user doesn't need to understand anything about the lightning network. They don't even need to know it exists. They can simply go to one of these solutions and say, I want to send this much value in my local currency. Let's say it's a certain amount of Indian rupees, or, uh, it's a certain amount of Brazilian, I think it's real that they have over there or any kind of currency. Like I want to send that to this other country in the world like handle it for me. And then that exchange will send it over the Lightning Network, which is for them used as their, their backend, to another exchange, which then automatically converts it and just pays that user out in their bank account. So that's the network that these companies are building up and have been building up over the past year-ish or so that basically allows people to use a Lightning Network without realizing it. So instead of having to go through traditional 
uh, banking rails, which is then the backend, which is much slower. We simply use a new backend without the user needing to understand it. And that allows the net Lightning Network to be used by far more people. It makes it much more accessible because those people don't necessarily need to know that it is being used. They only need to be explained, how does this work? Well, you send your money to this to this provider that you're connected with, and they'll make sure that this other person in this other country gets paid out in their local currency. And that's game changing. It's essentially improving on the model that fintechs use because a lot of fintechs, they use like uh, financial technology companies, they use kind of an accounting hack where they just have accounts at a lot of different banks around the world and then just do slow internal settlement. But here it instantly gets settled over the Lightning Network and that just makes it a lot uh, more approachable for companies in the space to be running that kind of model. And what it does is it essentially shifts the volatility risk that exists with Bitcoin. It shifts that over to a business, which is often far better equipped to deal with that. And they can charge small transaction fees to also offset that risk. So there's tremendous uh, room for growth here in sort of like beyond the individual user to consumer using Lightning to buy and sell goods. It can also be used by individuals and by businesses to do international settlement and remittances. And uh, I'm really excited to see that grow as well because it just opens up the possibilities of Lightning without users needing to understand the history of money, without needing to understand Bitcoin, without needing to understand what liquidity is and channels are and whether a wallet is custodial or non-custodial. So uh, I think that's really awesome to see and I'm hoping to see a lot more use cases emerge in the coming years where the threshold to use Lightning is just lower because the user doesn't always need to understand it. Sam, can you unpack it a little bit more when we're talking about the market for global remittances? So we're talking about a trillion dollar market here. We're talking about using Lightning as the new backend without people understanding. So mechanically walk us through are are you describing basically a forex transaction that happens immediately in the United States then the money moves via lightning network and then another forex uh, transaction in the home country and a swap and a deposit in the bank account so we're actually talking about still using the forex market uh from a bitcoin to local currency perspective but in terms of going from one currency to the next we're not actually using that anymore because we're using the Lightning Network Rail. Is that what you're describing? And can you just maybe describe some of the basics there of how Bitcoin Lightning Network potentially uh, solves the remittance problem? Yeah. So what essentially happens there, as you were describing, if you're based in the US and you're trying to send money to another country, then you just send your dollars to that exchange that you're connected to or that is your, your service provider, and they will simply say, okay, we take in this, this, these dollars and we send this amount of Bitcoin, the equivalent of that, sort of a value that you agreed upon when you press send. We send that over to this other exchange that we are connected with on the other side of the world. And that exchange will say, okay, we're going to, like we got in a bit of Bitcoin here, and now we can give this amount in, for example, Indian rupees to this user that is connected to the other exchange on the other side of the world. And then that, that exchange itself, they will need to figure out like how many rupees do we want to hold? How much Bitcoin do we want to hold? But they don't need to deal with, oh, we're getting a lot of dollars in from one side. Uh, and now we need to figure out like how much we, we hold in dollars, Bitcoin and rupees. Like they only need the two currencies that they are essentially focused on at a time. And yeah, as mentioned, the user doesn't need to understand that that is happening. They only need to know this is the amount of dollars I'm sending. And this is the amount of rupees that ultimately is received by the other party. That's a, that's really a game changer because we're going from three currencies to two in this uh, dynamic of maybe using Bitcoin as a remittance or a middle ground currency. Um, we're actually taking out the U.S. dollar risk for a company in a different country. And that's a, uh, it is a game changer for the remittance market and we're excited to see what kind of data you guys can provide the world with additionally going forward on that front. Uh, Sam, talk to us about the funding in Lightning Network companies, dynamic growth as well. And we're seeing it far outpace the general VC trends 
So what are you seeing? You guys are a recipient of that funding as well. So just talk to us about Lightning Network Venture Capital. What's the energy there and uh, what are the trends? Yeah, I think in the first few years, you see a lot of hobbyists emerge, a lot of tinkerers, a lot of people who start building sort of Lightning native companies. They look at an existing business model and then they try to replicate that in a way where sort of using the Lightning Network is the default, like, or that's even often the only option that you have. Uh, an example of that would be like streaming apps, for example, where instead of paying for a subscription with your credit card or whatever, you're just paying in, in Bitcoin over Lightning uh, on that kind of application. And what you can often ask there is like, but there are already podcasting apps, like lots of successful ones are already streaming apps or media apps, et cetera. So why would a lightning native version of that, where you can only use the lightning network, how will that become a successful business in the long run? That can be a big challenge because you don't, don't only need to become uh, profitable as a business, but you also just have all of the challenges to figure out that a business typically has in sort of scaling up and getting enough traction going. So what you then start seeing emerging a couple of years later is that other companies that already exist or Bitcoin companies, they start integrating with Lightning. They start seeing the network effect that is there, the fact that there are users that are making use of it. It's a bit hard to measure at the time, like a couple of years ago, people didn't really have any good insights. But uh, as that starts to grow, more and more people start getting involved. And then venture capitalists start seeing there is momentum here. There are both users, so, so demand is there, and supply is there. There are companies, but those companies need funds to be able to, to grow. And as a result, especially 2022 was a really big year there for Lightning funding, where over $400 million was raised by, uh, I believe, 28 or 29 companies or so. And that really sort of made people very aware that, you know, like VCs are buying into the thesis of the Lightning Network, as, as we discussed earlier, it's very likely going to stick around and be part of the scaling puzzle that Bitcoin has. It's not the only solution to it, and it still has a whole range of challenges to figure out. But people seem to be quite certain that it will be sticking around. And as a result, investors want to come in, like help this network to grow, help those companies to professionalize. And the professionalization there is really critical because if, if companies are eager to start using Lightning, but their infrastructure isn't robust enough and they start having issues, then they may get turned off to it. And people sometimes ask us from River Lightning's perspective, like, oh, what's it like being the service provider for uh, the Chivo wallet? Well, actually, like, it's a lot of responsibility because if we would mess up in some kind of way and that would cause them to be turned off to using the Lightning Network, that would mean negative press for the entire industry and have really big ramifications. So the Lightning companies in the space, like, there's amazing things open source developers can do, but they too need some kind of funding to be able to develop things to make it better, to hire people to do stuff professionally. And if you want to see the Lightning Network grow into sort of a global payments layer that's native to the internet, then you need stuff that's reliable, that's professionally built, that has professionals working on it that are properly paid for their work. And uh, that's really a difference that investors can make. Sam, what's next for your research? Where are you going? Or is it more Lightning Network? Or are, you, are you focusing on other topics in Bitcoin? Maybe just guide us into what you have uh, on the docket. Yeah, I've had this question a lot. Like you, you spend months working on a report and then the first question or like the second question you get from people is like, what's next? And I'm like, well, what's next is a break. <laughs> first of all, I need one because we were touching on it earlier, the, the global payments industry. That was my previous report. I did right before this one. So it's been two uh, pretty much back to back. And I'm going to be taking a break now and sort of evaluating like what project is going to make sense to work on next. I have lots of ideas, but uh, I want to test them, evaluate them, like dive into some of them and then figure out what the next step is going to be. Well, but, we uh, respect the long form research process. Absolutely. So we'll look forward to having you back whenever you publish your next report. Sam Wouters, research analyst at River. Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Please tell people. Uh, where they can find the report, where they can find your work. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, you can find me on Twitter at SD Wouters. And that's also where you can find the report. You can also find it on the River account and you can find it on blog.river.com where it's uh, listed at the top.
So that would be the easiest way to get in there and to see uh, many of the things that we didn't get to discuss, but you know, you, you don't want to have a four hour podcast. So no, but, uh, we have to, we sense. have to try to get to the highlights and, and explain to the audience uh, what we believe is most valuable, but people should definitely go check out the report if they want something deeper. Sam, thanks again for joining us. I'm Nick Bhatia at the Bitcoin Layer. We'll catch you guys next time. The Bitcoin Layer is sponsored by River. Go check them out today, river.com slash TBL for a Bitcoin only exchange and a great experience. River offers a DCA feature where you can stack sats without any fees. They offer Lightning Network withdrawals. So get your Bitcoin off of the exchange using Lightning Network instantly. And also the most important thing about River, guys, they do not use a third party custodian. They have a multi-sig storage solution so that your Bitcoin, once you purchase your Bitcoin using River, is not stored using a third party custodian. River has control of that Bitcoin using a multi-signature solution. And what's more, they suggest you get your Bitcoin off of the exchange and into your own pockets. So go check out River today.